Scripture says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My friends, our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Happy Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Happy Week of Epiphany. In our Christian liturgical calendar this past Wednesday was Epiphany, when we celebrate that our eyes are open to the presence of God in our midst. And on this Baptism Sunday, we celebrate God in Christ, coming in human form to the earth, and God anointing Jesus for the work that God wanted done on earth. And we recommit ourselves, if we feel so willing to do so, that we acknowledge our own baptism, that God put God's hand on each of us and says, I am your God, and you are my beloved child. And so as baptized believers in Christ, we live out our Christian faith, striving to be like Jesus Christ. So my friends, happy Baptism Sunday, happy Epiphany Week, and let us be assured that our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us begin with a wonderful hymn, some of you may know it and some of you may not, called Live Into Hope. from the second book in the Bible, the book called Exodus, which is the story of the Hebrew people, the Jewish Israelites, as they were led by God out of slavery and a really hard life into the promised land. And one of the things that happened in the book of Exodus is something that we call the ten plagues. Plagues are things that are really bad. They, they go wrong in life. They come upon a whole group of people and, and they either make people sick or they cause lots of problems. And God sent 10 different plagues to the Egyptian people, to the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt and, and the king's people uh, because they weren't open to God. They weren't loving God. So these hard, terrible things came. And when I was a young child, we had a Sunday school lesson. And the teacher kept taking out brown paper bags. Now, I don't know if any of you take brown paper bags to school when you have in-person school, or if all of you buy lunch or you take a lunch box, but I always took a brown paper bag uh, as my school lunch, and so did a lot of kids. And my kids took brown paper bags. But the teacher, my Sunday school teacher, had 10 bags. And she kept opening the bag, and she'd make 
one of us put our hand in the bag and pull something out of it. And the 10 bags had representations of the 10 plagues. So imagine that you put your hand in here and you pull out something that's all red and gooey and it represents that the Nile, the water in the Nile River turned red, it turned to blood. And, and so your hand got all covered with that red food coloring and it felt all slimy. Or another time you'd put your hand in the bag and you'd get something also kind of gooey, but it would represent what we call boils. Have you ever had like injuries on your skin and it gets pussy? So you'd feel like you were touching pus and you'd bring your hand out and it would represent that God, one of the plagues God put on the Egyptians was these boils, these sores all over their skin. Or you put your hand in there and there'd be an ice cube. It would be like in a little uh, Ziploc baggie so it wasn't melting, but it was really cold. And you take it out and it represented that God was pouring down hail. You know when hail comes, like little round balls of hail, the ice come down. And that went all over the people of Egypt. Or you put your hand in there and you get this little tiny bug. You know what gnats are? You know, little gnats that bug you. They're, they're almost too small to see, but they fly around. So God gave one of the plagues was gnats all over the people. Or you'd put your hand in here, and there'd be a little bigger bug, like a, almost like a grasshopper, and it's called a locust. And, and you pull it out, and that represented the plague of the locusts that were out there eating all the crops and destroying all the trees. And then one bag we put our hand in, there was nothing. Nothing at all. You reach around, you couldn't find anything because that represented darkness, because darkness came over the land for three days. That was one of the plagues. Or another one was represented death, because it was the, the poor animals all got diseased and, and they died. And uh, one of them was my favorite, and I have it here for you. It's gonna be hard for you to see because it's so little, but do any of you ever go out in a marsh or the backyard and you play with a frog. So I have a little frog here that a friend of ours brought to all of us in the church last year because he was going through a hard time with his health and he reminded us that frogs, F-R-O-G, the way you spell frog, stands for fully rely on God fully rely on God. One of the plagues that God sent was there were frogs everywhere in Egypt. But I like to think when we reach our hand in our paper bag and we pull out a frog, we remember that life can be really hard, but we fully rely on God. So kids, maybe you can play your own game. You can have your parents um, create 10 bags, or you can do it for your siblings, or you can do it for your parents. And, and put one of these, the ten plagues, a representation of each of them in a bag and have everyone reach their hand in and pull out and see if they can guess what plague that was. But the lesson that you want to remember is the one of the frogs, that we fully rely on God no matter how tough times are. So kids, when you're going through tough times, trust in God, all shall be well, God loves you, I love you. God bless you. I am going to read now our scripture verse for the day. It is from the book of Exodus, chapter 29, verse 46. Key verse in our second book of the Bible that we are looking at as we walk through the Bible in 2021. So last week we did Genesis, and now here we are in Exodus. Listen for the word of God as we find it in Exodus 29 verse 46 the Lord said and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt I dwell among them I am the Lord their God the Word of God for the people of God thanks be to God would you please pray with me Holy One, I ask that you speak through me, that you choose what I speak, what I share, what I say, 
that you speak by your spirit deep within each person who hears this message, that they would hear your biblical truth, your relevant teaching for daily living, that they would be drawn closer to you, more full of your sp spirit and more full of your love, more Christ-like in our actions, more full of faith and acting faithfully. Rid us of fear and ground us in your way of being. We pray this day, in Jesus' name, amen. The book of Exodus. We ended last week with the people of Israel as guests in the country of Egypt, the land of Egypt, guests of Joseph. They were being protected from the drought. They were being fed well. Well, the book of Exodus opens up and now suddenly the Israelites are slaves. They're put into slavery because it tells us early on that the king of Egypt, Joseph meant nothing to the new king who came into power. And so he didn't care about protecting Joseph's people. And so we see this conflict now set up between the leaders of the Egyptian people and the Israelites. And God was blessing the Israelites because the Israelites are representative in the Bible of God's people. And so Exodus is the, the mythical story of God's people and God's divine plan for all people to walk with God as their God and to see what God does as God protects them. And so God is protecting the Israelites and they are multiplying greatly. And the king of um, Egypt doesn't like that at all. He gets worried about their power and their might with their numbers. And so he decides to send them uh, into hard labor and into slavery. And life becomes really hard for them. And we have um, the story of the Hebrew midwives. So I'm going to go over some of the key stories. You're familiar with these stories in Exodus. It's a great book of the Bible for stories. And the stories are great for teaching us life lessons on how we can be more faithful and more at peace and fulfilling God's purposes for us. So remember the two Hebrew midwives named Shipra and Pua. And they were told by the Pharaoh to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. Well, they disobeyed and they didn't do it because they loved God. And so they were following God, not the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh found out and came and asked them, why are you not killing the baby boys? And remember their answer? They said, well, because the Hebrew women are so strong and they give birth so quickly before the midwife can arrive. So the Pharaoh wasn't happy with that and the, the Pharaoh's heart got hardened even more. But we then see the story, this is where the, we have the birth of Moses. Moses is one of our favorite figures in the Bible, right? One of God's leaders. And you know the story. His mom, Jochebed, gave birth to him, and he was supposed to be killed, but she hid him. And so he would be protected and stay alive. So for several months, she hid him, but she couldn't hide him anymore. So remember, she made a basket, and she covered it in tar to make it waterproof. And where did she put it? By the reeds, right? Um, by the Nile. And she put it there with a prayer that God would watch over her son. And sure enough, the Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the water and found this precious little baby in the basket and didn't know what to do. And so um, Moses' sister says, well, would you like me to find a Hebrew a mother to nurse this baby? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, I would. And so she took Moses back to Moses' mother to take care of Moses until he grew up and then he had to go, he got a little bigger and he was raised in Pharaoh's household in a life of privilege. So we hear then the call story of Moses and I want you to think about your call story. When did you first know that there was a God? When did you first feel God loved you? When did you first know that God talks to you and God has a plan for you and God has purposes for you. God calls you, you specifically, to do God's work. God needs you. God wants you. That's part of the baptism. 
You get God's hand on you, and God says, this is my child, and my spirit is upon this child. And then that's part of epiphany, that as we grow up and go through life, our eyes and our hearts and our minds get open, that God is with us. God's walking with us, and God's speaking to us. So we have the call story of Moses, and it begins when Moses is, um, sees the burning bush. Do you remember this? Because Moses has killed, he, he goes and he sees one of the Egyptian slave masters treating um, the Hebrew people really harshly. And it angers Moses, and he kills the slave master. And then he realizes that he's in trouble. So he flees. And when he flees, he comes upon the burning bush. There's a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed by fire. But the flames are coming out of it. And God's voice speaks to him through that bush. And God calls him. And God tells him that God's name is I am who I am. And this is the book where we get the name of God, Yahweh, the four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh. And, um, and Moses is not feeling qualified at all to lead God's people. And God gives Moses signs. And he says, if your people question you and if Pharaoh questions you of who you are and do you really hear from me, give them these signs. He says, take your staff. And he says, and when you touch it to the ground, it's going to turn into a serpent, and it does. And then he tells Moses, take your hand and put it in your pocket. Now pull it back out. And when he does, it's, it's leprous. It has leprosy. It's white as snow. And God says, you can do these signs anytime someone questions your authority as my leader. And Moses says, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I've always been slow of speech. Isn't this a familiar story? We don't feel adequate. We don't feel worthy. We don't feel qualified. We don't feel good enough. We compare ourselves to others. But God said to Moses, I am with you. Trust in me. So then as Moses went and led the people, um, we do see the Israelites grumbling and complaining. But this is after first the Pharaoh's gotten his heart hardened, and that's when God sends the ten plagues that I talked to the kids about. The plague after plague after plague came upon the Egyptian people, but it didn't change the Pharaoh's heart, didn't make the Pharaoh any more open to God. So one of the questions for us is, when we go through hard times, does, do they bring us to our knees that we become even more dependent on God? They open us up to be more vulnerable to God, more trusting to God, even in our feelings of inadequacy or our feelings of worthlessness or there's nothing we can do. We, we feel like our bodies aren't doing what we need them to do or we've aged and we're not the people we used to be or something's happened and our situation's changed. Are we able to still see and trust that God's hand is upon us and God's presence is in the midst of us and God needs us and is using us even in whatever our limited condition is, we can pray. We can pray for others. Sometimes that's the most powerful thing anyone can do. So God used Moses. God sent these plagues, these signs. And remember then Moses' brother Aaron came into the picture. And Moses and Aaron were sent to the Pharaoh to say, you know the famous line, let my people go. But the Pharaoh didn't let the people go. So we have this, the first 13 chapters of this great grand saga of God's divine plan in the book of Exodus is about the Israelite people as slaves in Egypt. And then we have the next five chapters. We have the Israelite people are with Moses and Aaron on their way to Mount Sinai, to the promised land. And we have more really grand stories. We have the parting of the Red Sea. And we have, remember that they're going through there and God just pushes the water back so the Israelites can make their way safely on dry ground. But when the Egyptians are following in their chariots, suddenly the water comes pouring back in and they drown. God has protected God's people. And we have the famous pillar of cloud and pillar of fire that 
God is with them, leading them by the pillar of cloud by day. And at night, when it gets dark, he's leading them by a pillar of fire, which provides light. So they can travel by day or by night, because God is leading them. God's presence is considered in that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire. And then, remember the people get hungry, they get tired, they get exhausted. Maybe you're feeling like that right now. Life gets really hard, and, you, and maybe you're like the Israelites. You're grumbling, you're complaining, you're frustrated. But God provided manna from heaven. That's where that term comes from, manna from heaven and quail. Suddenly there is dew, there is food, there's something to drink, there's something to eat. God's provision is upon them. And that's where our faith comes in. God's provision is always upon us, too. If we can just be in the moment, not be borrowing trouble from tomorrow and not be remembering the trouble from the past, but right in this moment, be looking to God, trusting in God, breathing in of God's spirit, God provides. And then we have the last 22 chapters till through chapter 40, the end of the book of Exodus when they're at Mount Sinai. And this is the book where we get the Ten Commandments. And we get them two different times, in fact. But we get the Ten Commandments. And so we suddenly are remembering that God gives us rules for living. God orders our lives so that they will work well. They'll be in harmony with one another, something we all desperately want for our country, for our world, for our own homes. Harmony, an ordered way of living that's in line with God's teaching. And so these last chapters are all about God giving Moses the tablets, the commandments, the laws, not only for daily living, but for worship and for treatment of animals. And yet, just like we do, they backslide. Do you ever, have you already found yourself first 10 days of the new year, you make resolutions and oops, that one slipped up today and then maybe you get a little discouraged. Discouragement is never of God. Despair is never of God. God loves us and there's nothing we can do. There's no resolution we can fulfill that will make us more lovable or more worthy in God's eyes. God loves us as we are. So our challenge is to say, thank you, God, for your love, and then let that love fill us and heal us and make us whole. So God gives us these laws, and you know them, the Ten Commandments. First of all, he says, I am the Lord your God. So the first one is, do we allow God to be our God? We shall have no other gods before him. We shall not make anything else an idol. Idolatry is one of the biggest issues in our country right now. We make lots of things idols. We value things more than we value the will of God. We're idolatrous people. If you want to study more about that, just look it up. Google it. But we are idolatrous. We put all sorts of things, desires, wants, what we think are needs, um, thoughts ahead of God instead of just trusting in God. So we shall have no other gods before him, no idols. We shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. When we talk about the Lord, it should be that we're understanding God is sacred and holy. God is other. God is different from ourselves. And God is a God of peace and a God of love. So we don't take the name of the Lord in vain. We honor our mother and father. You may have had a good mother and father, or you may have had one that really caused a lot of pain. But we honor that they gave us life. We're here because of them. It doesn't mean we have to engage in their abuse or be codependent. But we honor the life-giving power that our mother and father brought us into this world. We honor the Sabbath. Remember in Genesis, God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. We rest. Why do we need a Sabbath? A Sabbath is a time with God. So I encourage you in the new year to carve out your time on a daily basis and a weekly basis to just enjoy life. You know, when we have things like this week, what things that have happened, the horrible violence, the horrible protests that turn violent for some of the people, the killings, the fear when our own capital and our country's capital gets breached. And yet we want to remember that we, we don't want to always be engaged in the fear. We don't always want to be engaged in watching these reruns of this violence. We want to have a Sabbath from all of that, 
a Sabbath with the Lord, that the Lord just fills us. We do things that we enjoy, that put a smile on our face and joy in our hearts, that make us glad to be alive. So honor the Sabbath, that you're grateful to be alive. You count your blessings. You enjoy life. Don't feel guilty about being happy when things are going terribly wrong at other moments and in other places. And then we have the five do not do these things of the Ten Commandments. You know them. I'm simplifying the language, but don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, don't be greedy for what someone else has, don't compare yourself to what they have and you don't have. It's called don't covet, covetousness. And don't commit adultery. Don't be unfaithful. Love the one that you've committed yourself to. So this is the outline of the book of Exodus. And I want to just say that I encourage us in this teaching about the book of Exodus to find freedom, just as the Israelites were taken to freedom from bondage. This is the story that reminds them that God, as it says in Exodus 29, 46, is their God, and this is the God who delivered them out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, where they were treated harshly and unfairly, and into the promised land. I don't know if you're in the promised land right now in your life. I don't know if you're in the sweet spot of life, or I don't know if you're in a really troubled part. I know our world is in a really troubled place. But God's divine plan is to free all of us, to free us from fear, to free us for faith, to free us for faithfulness. So we want to be freed from all sorts of things. And you can make your list. What do you need to be freed from? Someone said to me, I need to be freed from monotony and boredom. My kids weren't allowed to say they were bored when they were growing up because boredom to me shows a lack of creativity, a lack of coming up with things to do to entertain yourself, a lack of imagination. But I know during COVID, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of people who are feeling that life is monotonous. We want to be freed from monotony, freed from the oppressive weight, this is what a young person said to me, of existential dread. What is the purpose of life? What am I here for? I feel like it's just a crisis, this person said to me. Free from um, judgments. Free from our own perceptions and judgments. Free from other people's perceptions of us and judgments. Free from expectations, others and our own. Free from limited thinking and small-mindedness. Free from greed or from self-centeredness. We are in a culture of greed and self-centeredness. We want just like the Israelites were freed from slavery, we want to be freed from fear of making the wrong decisions or the wrong choices. We want to be in the moment. We want to be free from addictions and from violence and misguided desires and from comparing ourselves to others. The Bible never says worry about this. In fact, it says fret not. The Bible doesn't say go and stress about this. The Bible says trust in God. The Bible says nothing is impossible with God. Fear not. Love casts out fear, it says in 1 John 4, 8. We want to be free for faith. Just like the Israelites were freed from slavery, the Israelites were freed for faith, for trust in God. Yes, it would have been easy for them to be stuck in the terrible fear during the plagues that are happening in the country of Egypt and to be fearful when Moses saw the burning bush. It would have been easy when they were at the water and the Egyptians are coming quickly behind them not to trust. But God freed them for faith so that they could trust. The man and the quail came. God was present. God provided. The pillar of cloud came. The pillar of fire came. I want us all to be free for faith, that our world will be harmonious at least as far as we are concerned. We will be at peace. We will have serenity and joy and strength and the mercy of the Lord because you know nothing is impossible for God, Luke 1, says. And finally, we want to be free for faithfulness, the Christ-like way of being on this baptism Sunday. We are changed when God touches us, when God heals us, when God makes us whole emotionally, spiritually, in our heart, in our mind, in our soul. And, uh, and we can just look to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the Christ-like way of being. Being faithful is we are not limited. Our trust is in God. So I want to close with this. Years ago, I received 
the Dr. Seuss quote, um, don't cry that it's over, smile that it happened. That would have been a good verse all the way through 2020, that the things we couldn't do, we were crying about, we couldn't do anymore, but instead we could be rejoicing and smiling in the memories that we could do them. So I want to tell you about someone named Kelly. I've told you about her many times, but it fits the story of freedom. When Kelly got to college, I think Kelly was hoping to be an Olympic skier as her mother had been, and Kelly was on her college ski team and she was a star. But in one of the races, when she went down the mountain, she fell and she had a spinal cord injury. So she's paralyzed from the chest down. She can use her arms. But the doctors didn't think she'd ever have a normal life again. She went to rehab. Her boyfriend that she had been dating for a few months dropped out of school also, stopped out of school to go to rehab with her, to encourage her and give her hope. And she came back and, and she finished school. But the important part is at the same time this was happening to this girl named Kelly, someone else I knew connected to my church fell off a roof and had a spinal cord injury. And that person never got out of bed again probably did what I would have done, curled up in the fetal position and just was in the state of despair from then on, and now has died 20 years later. Was so heartbroken of the unfairness of life. But in contrast, I watched the story of Kelly, and Kelly and her family started a foundation. And I encourage you, any of you who are bike riders, to join them in a bike ride every September around the state of Vermont. But she started a foundation to buy adaptive equipment for spinal cord injury patients so that they could be inspired that they could still live an active life. And so she has. They didn't think she'd ever be able to have kids. Remember, she is paralyzed from the chest down. She's had two beautiful children by the miracles of science and medicine. And she has so much adaptive equipment that she can ski, she can bike ride. She lives the most active life. She became a nurse practitioner living by herself on the cobblestone streets in Boston because before she got married to this college boyfriend, she wanted to prove that she could be independent. She has an adaptive car that she can drive. My friends, may this Exodus story remind us that God is with us, that hard things happen, but God calls each of us as God called Moses, and God is with each of us as God provided for the Israelite people and for Moses' leadership, and we too can be free from fear, free for faith in this mighty, mighty God, the sovereignty of God, and free for faithfulness as we see God in Jesus Christ showing us how to act and to live. Let's now listen to Swing Low, Sweet Chariot.
Lord God, we come now as we pray for those in need, which at this time, with the events of this week, feels like all of us. Really, we're always all in need, Lord. We always need you, but this week feels like our world needs you even more than usual. We pray for democracy to prevail. We pray for more peace and kindness in our world. We pray for healing for those who, whose bodies are in need of healing, healing for those whose minds are in need of healing, healing for those whose emotions and relationships and finances and careers and hopes and dreams are in need of healing. Lord, we pray for those who have given up. They've lost hope. They've had faith, and they don't think you're coming through for them. And, and so they found themselves now in a place of such emotional grief and pain and hopelessness. Touch them. Remind them that they are your people. Lord, if there's anyone who has not yet been baptized, who has not given their heart to you, and said, I want to trust in you. I want you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all that I've done that has not trusted in you. Lord, lead them to contact us so that they can be baptized, even in this time of quarantine, so that their hope and their faith can be renewed. Lord, we ask that you fill us all with life in Christ and let our world be Christ-like. We are so grateful for your love. We're so grateful for... Uh, epiphany and eyes that give us your light, that shine your light. And we're so grateful that we know the end of the story. All shall be well, even if we are in the midst of the plagues, even if we're in the midst of bondage, even if we're in the midst of hunger and thirst or confusion. We need your pillars of cloud and fire. Let us live by your commandments and let us trust in you. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus as we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We always give our invitation for offering because you know that sharing from our blessedness is one of our acts of faithfulness. It's one of our ways of saying, God, I trust in your divine plan. God, I trust in who you are. So in whatever way you feel led to give to God, that's the biblical commandment. Christians have always understood that to mean to support the church because the church is the body of Christ and has been created to be a voice of Christ, a presence of Christ, a community of Christ. But I encourage you, you may give to the church, I hope you do, give to God, however you understand that to mean, so that you are participating and trusting in the divine plan and you are engaging this act of faithfulness that you understand our verse. God says, I and their Lord, their God, and they will remember that I brought them out of bondage. So whatever you need to be brought out of, make, make a little deposit on it. Give to God and say, thank you, Lord, that you will bring me freedom from fear, freedom for faith, and freedom for faithfulness. God bless you all for your generosity, for your faith, and for your acts of faithfulness. And now go forth on this Baptism Sunday. Renew your commitment that you belong to the Lord. May we don't ever re-baptize, but may your baptismal vows, whether your parents made them or you made them then upon your confirmation of your baptism, may your baptismal vows be renewed this day with the power of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence, the grace, the community, of God's Holy Spirit upon you this day and forever and ever. Amen.
Master. 